Trent Baalke spoke at the NFL Combine. I'll tell you where the Jaguars' help is going to come from in just a second here on Locked on Jaguars. You are Locked on Jaguars, your daily Jacksonville Jaguars podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Wiggins, the host of Locked On Jaguars. Thank you for joining me for today's show. We appreciate you joining us here on your daily Jaguars podcast, where it's your team every day, and we thank you for making us your first listen. Quick reminder, we're also free on any and all platforms, wherever you get your podcast. We also have a great YouTube page where you can see my pretty mug every single day, so make sure you like and subscribe to that page as well what's, what's going on good people i'm glad y'all joined me today I'm very happy to have you along for another episode of the show where it's combine time so there are questions i'm gonna tell you where i left off yesterday i asked the question on our last podcast where's the help gonna come from how the how how we're gonna apply help when everyone's being retained is it just going to be a matter of drafting players that have to perform and then developing. It's a good question. And it was semi answered today by Trent Balky. I'm not going to give you quotes, but I am going to give you a bunch of paraphrases. And one of the things that he said during a one-on-one interview at the table, uh, when he was being interviewed, not necessarily when he was at the podium initially, when he was being interviewed, he let us know that help is going to come from within. They are no longer going to be a big spender in free agency. In fact, it sounds like the big spending days in free agency are over. They're going to trust their, their, their themselves, their instincts to be able to draft players. They're going to supplement the draft with free agency. So what you're going to get is drafting, player development. That's where it's going to come from. And then retention. So it's extremely important that we understand that at least this year, with the exception of Jim Bob Cooter, there is so much continuity on this staff. Like they didn't lose people going all over the place. So staff continuity is extremely important. Um, And they're probably going to start preparing themselves sort of the way the teams that do it real well, like the Eagles and the Chiefs, they're going to have some quality control guys and they're going to have some of assistant position guys just about at every position i think moving forward if they don't already i think they do i know there's a bunch of people i see over there all the time on the field that most folks don't know the name of them i I think what you're going to start seeing is they're going to start seeing some elevation through at at some point if people start rating the coaching staff you're going to start seeing some elevation of the staff why is that important because continuity is going to be important if you're depending a lot on development because player development requires consistency. It also requires somebody to be able to be there that knows what these guys are doing on a daily basis and they can stand on the table for them. It can tell you that when you, because inevitably what's happening is, I know I said retention is a big deal for the Jaguars, but it's inevitable that what happens is you can't keep everybody, especially if you start winning a lot of games. A lot of guys going to get overpaid. And what I mean by that is, there are going to be a lot of teams that come after a lot of players from a quote unquote good team uh, down the road. And what's going to happen is those guys are going to go get their money. Some of them will play well. Some of them won't be in the same situation. So you might not see the same input. It does not mean that they're bad players. It's just that the Jaguars are building this. And, and Trent said today, good players are going to want to come play here. This is a destination spot for people, right? So when you get a destination spot for folks, Guys are going to want to stay, but guys are also going to eventually start balancing out the fact that they need to get paid. And in the salary cap area, you can't pay everyone, even though it appears that the cap isn't real. They're making it do what it, what it does. However, for if this team gets really good, that's going to get a lot more difficult to do. So we're going to uh, be able to, to 
really get into what drafting, developing, and retention is today. Um, in segment two and three, I want to talk about exactly where they're going to probably, what they're going to address, what positions they're going to address. And I'm going to give you a hint with something. There are six or seven positions in the NFL that they're considered the most important ones. They used to be like four or five, but I think it's extended now to about six or seven. And I'm going to tell you where all of those six or seven positions are and that the Jaguars have already hit on most of those spots. Not all, but most of them. And they've done it in the draft. So the last two years when they were signing players, especially last year, even though they spent a boatload of money, they signed a lot of people. That was a lot of infrastructure. They signed a lot of infrastructure people. The others that we have called it here before, a a term that I've used on those guys that aren't necessarily a frontline guys, but they're extremely important. Uh, only maybe one position that they really reach out and go and get someone who is Foyola Wakan at that off the ball slash line, uh, Mike linebacker spot, who is extremely important. I think he's the play caller on the defense. He is the leader on defense. He sets everybody up, tells everybody where they're supposed to be because he's right in the middle of the action. He's the one guy that they signed in free agency that holds one of those uh, sacred positions on the football team. So I'll tell you uh, that Trent Baalke had a plan and it looks as if when they were in free agency, what they were trying to do was they were trying to get their second and third receiver. Okay. They were trying to get some interior linemen. They were trying to get um, a, a nickel, a possible nickel uh, guy to play the nickel and, the, the real hardcore positions of value, quote unquote, as we've heard that term before. Well, they drafted those guys and they're going to continue to draft those guys. I'm going to talk about that in just a second on Locked on Jaguars. As we go, transition from segment one to segment two. And I'm going to let you know about today's sponsor. And that is Built Bar. Man, Built Bar is off the chain. And you know that it has to be good for you if I'm devouring them right now because I have pledged to lose some weight and I'm already started on it. But I did not have to sacrifice everything that tastes good because Built Bar is covered with 100% chocolate and it absolutely tastes like I'm cheating every single time when I have Built Bar. Great flavors, man. Uh, Coconut puffs, double chocolate, cookies and cream. Yeah, I said I'm eating this stuff while I'm losing weight. And that's because the macros are, are right where they need to be. Only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. I used to tell you to go to built.com and you can still go there. Or if you're anywhere near a Sam's club or a Walmart, you can just run in and grab a four or 13 box treat of built bars. The hit flavors at Sam's club, brownie batter and churro, you can thank me later. You can thank me right now, in fact, because Built Bar is the snack for me and it should be the snack for you too. Make sure you check out Built Bar at built.com and at Sam's and Walmart. Running it down here, talking about Trent Balky and the plan and what's going on. So sometimes you don't know what the plan is. And, and I've always said that if you don't know what somebody's doing, while they're doing it that's a good thing for them because it should be done on a need to know basis and one of the things that no one owed us an explanation about was the way that they were trying to build this team now in hindsight here the the quote unquote position positional value picks that or the positional value positions that exist on a football team it used to be this it used to be Quarterback, left tackle, pass rusher, number one wide receiver, and corner. So the ultimate goal is you got to find a quarterback, then you have to find someone who can protect your quarterback, and then you have to find someone who can harass the quarterback of the other team. 
then find someone that you throw to and then find someone who can stop the number one receiver on the other team. We've extended that as of lately. We don't we don't just say left tackle. We say offensive tackle because they're both equally uh, hard to find, you know, because the right tackle position now has to guard against very athletic guys like they always had to guy, guard guys like J.J. Watt when he wasn't lined up inside, but now you got T.J. Watt. Von Miller was always out there. So there have been a lot of pass rushers, and a lot of teams are doubling up on their pass rush. Therefore, when the, when the Chiefs go to their pass rush package, they stick Chris Jones out there. You can't just put a road grader who can't move his feet anymore at left tackle. I mean, at right tackle. So now both guys have to be equally athletic a la Lane Johnson and and players like that. So we include the right tackle position in there. We also go back to the the uh, captain of the defense, which is normally the Mike linebacker. That's an extremely important position, as well as at least one of the interior defensive linemen, depending on how you play. If it's it, sometimes in a three, four, it's a guy who can eat up space in the middle. Sometimes it's a, a combination of him and a three technique, a guy that makes all the difference. Of course, it's easy to bring up Aaron Donald, but I'll bring up Cameron Hayward in Pittsburgh as a guy who can do a lot of different things and play a lot of different techniques. So add in the free safety, especially with the way that today's game is played when the safeties aren't always split. And a lot of times you see a single high safety the way Andre Cisco is, and he covers so much ground. It takes an extremely special player to be able to do that. If a team doesn't have that guy, they don't run that coverage on the back end. They do some other stuff. But when a team does get someone who is sudden and someone who has a, a serious change of direction, uh, the guy, of course, Earl, Ed Reed is the, the, the number one guy. But since then, we've had guys like Eric Berry and um, Earl Thomas, that were that same player and teams go out looking for that. And someone, a scout actually told me at Jaguars practice once the hardest thing to find is a guy who can really be a free safety, a single high free safety outside of the quarterback position, because a lot of times the things that they're running in college that do doesn't do that, you know, with the way colleges are, are you know, you usually have it spread out. Uh, guys are second level spread out and you don't have that one dude sitting back uh, like you do in the NFL. So when you can get a guy who can do that, those are the premium positions. So like I said, it kind of extends to like seven people. If you're running a West Coast offense or a variation of it, you need a good tight end, right? Uh, although it's not on my list of those things. So the reason why I brought those positions up, because if we, Look at what has happened, and I don't know if it was done on purpose or on accident, but either way, you have to give Trent Baalke credit for it. The number one wide receiver position will be Calvin Ridley. As much as we love Christian Kirk, and they're going to spread the ball around a lot, and he's sort of like a 1B, but mainly he's a number two, and he's probably going to end up in the slot, especially when they go to three wide. The number one guy is going to be Calvin Ridley, that alpha receiver. That was done via trade. Your quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, was drafted. Both tackles were drafted, even though it was before Trent Baalke. But even your third tackle, your swing tackle, was drafted. Luke Fortner, your center, another positional value uh, player, was drafted. Hopefully he is um, good enough over the long haul to replace someone else and we talk about teams that have had luck and fortune with positions the jaguars went from brad meester and i don't know if there was a gap but it doesn't really seem like there was a gap to they went from brad meester who played how long did brad Meester? i think he played longer than anybody in in, in his organization brad meester what did he go for 14 years yeah, Brad Meester went from 14 years, and then they they went from him, and they had the next center for like eight years, right? From for like eight straight years, the 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 Jacksonville Jaguars. So you're talking about 22 years um, 
of of fortune at that position. So this is what we talk about when you say draft and de- and develop. Brandon Linder, they went. Uh, Brandon Linder got here, I believe, in two thousand. I want to say two thousand thirteen, and he left last year. So seven or eight years at, at, at play at a very very high level, and then they drafted Luke Fortner. So when you draft Luke Fortner, you anticipate that Luke Fortner is going to be here for a while. And that that's some, if Fortner turns out and it looks like he's going to and they retain him and he plays for eight to ten years, that would mean the Jaguars literally have three guys play the center position over a 30 year period. That is the that is the epitome and that is the actual um, example of draft develop and retain that you love to see from a critical position. We mentioned the, the linebacker position uh, with uh, Foyo Lewakan. He's one half of it. Of course, Devin Lord and Chad Moomer make up the rest. Uh, so, so Oluwakan's half and each one of those guys represents 25%, right? The safety position, Andre Cisco drafted. The number one corner on this team, Tyson Campbell drafted. So, I just covered all of those premium positions that I spoke on and those positions were drafted. If you think about Devon Hamilton, who I think is their best interior lineman drafted. So uh, when you look at it, the premium positions, the ones that have the highest positional value were draft picks at those spots. The supplemental positions the ones that you can you can draft guys at those spots too especially if you already have people at the premium spots the ones that you don't have to pay as much for they got those in free agency isn't that something it's kind of the way it's supposed to go it went differently it went backwards i think most of the time people think you're going to draft and then once you get your people in place now you'll start supplementing Remember back in the day, I said something not too long ago. I said, you don't have to wait. It's not going to come in order because you don't know what players are going to be in the draft every single year and what positions. So therefore, while you're waiting and trying to figure it out, and I'm and I'm talking about the folks that believe you can't, you can't draft a quarterback until you get a line. You can't draft a running back until you get a line. You can't draft a receiver until you get a quarterback. No, but you can build your team and supplement your team with really, really good players until these other guys are able to be drafted and developed like the Jaguars have done the last couple of years. I'm going to go through that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what Trent Baalke said about Evan Ingram, Jawan Taylor and Arden Key. And we'll do that in just a second here in the third and final segment of Locked on Jaguars. All right, rolling along here in the third and final segment of Locked On Jaguars, where it's your team every day. We thank you for making us your first listen. We also thank any new listeners that joined us, and you are joining us by the numbers. We see it every single day. You're home. Once you come in, you have what we call tenure. All you got to do is be here for five seconds, and that gives you tenure just like anybody who's been here for five months or five years. Come on in, kick your shoes off, and join us here on Locked On Jaguars. Make sure y'all... Hit that like button. I've never asked too much on YouTube, but hit that like button. Somebody told me it means something. So hit the like button for me. And also, when you make comments, sometimes check back. And uh, I may not comment right away, but sometimes I go through those comments and I comment like yesterday. People were asking me, where did I get this hat? Right. It's Duval till we die, man. DTWD. Go find them on Twitter, Jaguars fans, and they'll have all of that information for you. Um, It sounds like they want to re-sign Jawan Taylor and they want to re-sign Evan Ingram. It sounds as if if Evan Ingram doesn't agree to a deal, there's a good chance he might get the franchise tag. And Trent joked, guy says, which one of those will get the tag if you have to because you only get one? Trent goes, we only got one? He says, yeah. So Trent laughed it off, but I think it's more likely that Evan Ingram gets the tag because that's a lower, um, that's a lower cap number, and that number is probably on an annual basis close to what he'll get anyway on a multi-year deal. It's just how it'll be structured in terms of it being bonuses 
and all of that stuff. Something hit to hit real quick. The Jags right now, I believe the graphic said today that they were uh, over $13 million on the plus side of the cap, which is good because they today announced that they restructured Brandon Scherf, Zay Jones. Those are the main two that I saw. We had already saw uh, the Foy Ola Wakan um, restructuring. So they're taking guys that they know are going to be here for the long haul once again, and they're restructuring their deals to free up some cash and to free up some cap space. And I don't think they're done with that because if you ask me, there's a about $13 million out there that's going to get cleared the second that they decide to announce that they're going to uh, cut or not retain Shaquille Griffin. So that number will go up. Uh, I'm thinking that they hope that they can – Resign Evan Ingram first, take care of that. Then right before free agency, they can hammer something home, a long-term deal with Juwan Taylor, which sounds like they ain't going to try to go overboard and break the bank. But in negotiations, sometimes what happens is folks start asking for this, just to push to see how far they can go. And then right when it's crunch time, they um, if the money is close to what they believe will happen, Jawan Taylor will probably say, you know what? I want to stay here. Kids from Florida, kid played in Gainesville. They got a good thing rolling here. He's wanted at the right tackle spot. So all those folks that thought, well, they could just let him walk because they have walk a little, not so. And I told you it wasn't. You know, if they end up having to do that, that's what they'll do. If they end up doing that, I think what they're going to do is they're going to end up drafting a, a right tackle because they'll need three anyway, right? And, and then they'll need one in development because I don't know how long they're going to hang on to Cam uh, Robinson. I know he'll be there this year because if he wasn't going to be here this year, this um, that dead money is going to put the Jaguars right back where they were. So I think they're going to let him at least come back and get healthy and go out and compete for his job this year. Um, not much of a mention of Arden Key other than the fact that Arden Key played real well. If there's one of these three, I think they're expecting could probably get away from them. It's probably Arden Key. So what does that mean for the draft? They have these critical positions covered. Darius Williams is their corner opposite Tyson Campbell, and he, he's not as good at nickel as he is on the outside. He's better on the outside. He ain't great on the outside, but he's good. They, you know, you saw him win a championship when he could have very well been picked on because the Rams had Jalen Ramsey. And Cincinnati was throwing at Jalen more than they were throwing at him. So uh, the thing is, is you, you, know, you have to wonder, what are the positions where drafting someone at a certain position doesn't mean that another good football player is just sitting on the bench? Like if you draft a first-round tackle to compete, you're probably hoping that he starts. Now, this changes a little bit as these draft picks get further and further away from the top. So it's something that we're not used to when the team is picking 24th. There might not be as much pressure to play a guy like that. But when you're rotating dudes at certain positions, like edge, that's how you even know who Arden Key's name is and who that is, is because you know who Dewan Smoot is, because they play a role on this team. Those guys get 30 snaps, and it's critical that you get a bunch of players at those positions. The other is corner where you can run a guy at nickel. If you draft another corner, he has to be someone that you project can play both inside and outside. I would not use a first round pick solely on someone that plays in the slot, uh, unless I'm the Super Bowl champion and I really have nothing else to spend my money on, but I, I will get a guy who projects to the outside, but who knows how to play inside as well. We mentioned Jalen Ramsey. I mean, those guys, there's a guy like Jalen is really, really rare, but you do have players who might not be that good, but who can do a little bit of both and who are very, very serviceable and make your team a lot, a lot better. So I think you can look at that. I think safety, you can do it at safety too. I think is a little bit more difficult to sell that way, but because you're already a good team and a playoff team, as long as you can get quality production from a player like that, and he can also be, your fill in if someone gets banged up and he might be your insurance in case a, a year goes by and Rayshon Jenkins wants to get a raise and you have to start making business decisions. You'll have someone already. So 
in my opinion, pay very, very close attention to positions where you need more than two people uh, in your rotation. That means corner. That means edge. And that means tight end because they run a lot of two tight end sets. Thinking about that, that lines up perfectly with what I see on the value board. A in fact, Trip Balky mentioned today that they they don't think they're going to move way up, but they might be a candidate to move up a little bit. And I think that means that if there's a player that they, they're looking at right there and they target right there, two or three picks in front of them, and it means, a, you know, a swap of thirds or it means uh, giving up a fourth, I think they'd go do it, especially if they feel like the dude is just, oh, he, 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 his value is too high for him to be sitting there. But I, the way I've been doing my mocks, every time I come up with one, what happens when I get to 24, I look at the next 15 picks, and there are like 10 guys that will help the Jacksonville Jaguars. Another position to watch out for is offensive guard um, with Osiris Torrance and players like that. And there are a lot of people now that haven't been in those you know, top 40 on that board. A lot of those folks that are starting to creep up in and more and more from this week when you watch the combine, a lot of guys are going to start getting bumped up that high. The McDonald kid, the edge rusher out of Iowa State, is is someone to watch out for. Um, Keon White, I, I watched the tape, and I, I just couldn't stop looking at it. He may not necessarily be the stand-up edge you need, and he may be a little bit raw, but he might not be. And then the kid at Iowa, the edge rusher, is like, oh, my God. So I'm starting to take a look. At, at some of these players and i'm sitting here thinking like man oh man oh man there's a lot there and there's a lot that's going to be there and this is all new for us because normally we don't pick you know you're, you're not picking you're not picking here and, and you're usually taking somebody at a higher position and you're a pretty bad team so what happens when you get up to that point is you pick the obvious good player right it's like the obvious pick and he has to come in here and he has to damn near play savior because the team has been so bad in the past and it's different now. What I'm talking about is Lucas Van Ness. If the Jaguars are able to get anywhere close to Lucas Van Ness, he is for real, man. He is like, he, he's just that athlete. He's like the defensive version of what uh, Luke Musgrave is, right? And they're both named Luke, by the way. If they take Lucas Van Ness, that's going to, I, I can hear it now. Everybody's going to see it. Ah, they got Aiden Hutchinson anyway. They're going to try to compare Lucas Van Ness to Aiden Hutchinson. He's a white guy. He's tall. He plays edge. But no, he does actually play like his feet are on fire. So I really believe that it's an opportunity for the Jaguars to address a lot of positions and to do it with, like, no shame at all. In fact, Lucas Van Ness is. He's 269 pounds. That's exactly how much Aiden Hutchinson weighs. But he's, you know, inch and a half shorter. He's 6'5", but, man, go watch that tape. It'll give you an idea. The Jaguars can really flat out just sit at 24 and draft a stud, somebody that you know is going to help this team. They can slide back, get an extra third, or maybe even more than that if they slide. If you go from 24 to 35, or 36, that might cost you a second. I don't know if it will, um, but maybe if you go from 24 to 35, right, you get that second, and then you can get a third. Maybe you'd have to send back a fifth in order to secure those two higher picks. So, And then you can find those teams that have multiple second-round picks as well. But in, in any event, I think the Jaguars are going to get two starters minimum from uh, Thursday and Friday. Two starters minimum and maybe three, depending on how they finesse um, the rest of uh, the draft. We're going to finesse. We ain't going to finesse, y'all. We're going to be we're gonna be real with you all week, bringing more information from the Combine as it is made available. Until then, you guys take care of each other, and thank you again for joining us on Locked on Jaguars and making us your first listen.